Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you joined us today. God's Word is clear that Christian life is meant to be lived publicly and in community. In this series, Pastor Skip explores how Christian worship, fellowship, and spiritual development flourishes when we get in the room. Good morning. Uh, would you turn in your Bibles, please? Did you bring one? Uh, turn in your Bibles to where? Acts chapter 2. Yes, you've been here the last couple months. That's where we are, Acts chapter 2, as we conclude this little series called In the Room, Acts chapter 2. So in 1949, a man by the name of John Courier was arrested and given a life sentence for murder. He denied that he committed the murder. He was put in prison anyway. After a few years, he uh, was paroled to work on a work farm uh, in the Nashville, Tennessee area. That's where all this took place. In 1968, his sentence was commuted. It was terminated. And a letter was sent to the prisoner telling him that he was free. He never got the letter. He continued to work as an incarcerated prisoner on that work farm for another 10 years years until a parole officer discovered the notification, told the prisoner, and he was given freedom. The question is this, would it matter if somebody sent you the most important message of your life, but you never received it? Of course, the answer is yes, it would matter greatly. That's the thought behind this vision weekend, making more room for people to hear the world's most important message. Now, In the Room is a little series that we uh, base on this premise that something happens when God's people gather together with each other. In the room we learn, in the room we worship, in the room we find purpose, in the room we connect, etc. We've been fairly comprehensive in looking at this life of the very first church, the, the prototypical church in the book of Acts. But it's not a complete picture. If we were to end what we have done without what we're about to read, it would not be a complete picture. It would be imbalanced because what we have examined heretofore is just the interior life of the church. This is what they did when they gathered together to themselves. We need a, a phrase, a sentence found in verse 47 uh, to balance it out. And that verse says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Without that verse, we would get the wrong impression. Without this verse, we might think that they were just a Christian club a Christian ghetto. They just sort of hung out with each other and sung songs and read their Bibles and, and enjoyed all of the benefits as members of this club. But they did more than that. They reached out to people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers more and more people. The called out ones became the sent out ones. The church, that's what it means. The church, ecclesia, means called out ones. But the called out ones became the sent out ones. Now, this is Vision Weekend. And I always feel that I need to clarify that because people can get the impression when we talk about Vision Weekend that we're proposing, hey, this is our vision. This is where we want to go in the next year. I hope you don't care what my vision is. My vision is inconsequential, as is yours or ours. What we should be doing rather than that is discovering what his vision is for the church, because after all, it's his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And so we want to discover what is God's vision for his church. This week I was 
thumbing through the Gospel of Luke, and in chapter 14, there is a parable. You will recognize this story. Jesus gave a parable about a man who gave a great supper, and he sent out invitations for people to come, and one by one, people gave excuses of why they couldn't be at the supper. So one guy said, you know, I bought some property, and I got to go check it out, so I, I can't make it. Uh, which is a lame excuse because, you mean, you, you bought it without checking it out? Uh, the second guy said, well, I bought five head of oxen. I got to go test them. Another guy said, I just got married, and you know how that goes. I can't go either. So one by one, they had excuses, and the guy who sent out the invitations uh, was unhappy with that, and so he said to his servants, then go into the streets and the alleys and bring in the poor and the crippled. And so they did. And they came to him and they said, we did it, but there's still room. So he then said, then go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God wants his house filled. God wants heaven full. He wants, in a word, every seat taken. He wants it filled with all your noisy kids. He wants your weird uncle, your crazy aunt. He wants them all. Revelation chapter 5, there's that beautiful anthem that the people of God will sing. You have redeemed us by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, nation, people. Around the throne of God, people, people, people. Well, what is our part in that? How, what do we do about that? How do we open our doors to bring in more people to hear the most important message? Well, that brings us to the theme of this final message, and that is the theme of evangelism. And looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 47, I'm going to confine my remarks chiefly to that verse. Um, we're going to look at four components of evangelism. Four components. The first is this. It's a divine work. Evangelism is a divine work. Notice in verse 47, it begins in that sentence after it says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Evangelism is God's work. He is the one that superintends it. He fuels it. He inspires it. As John Stott wrote, God is the principal evangelist. Verse 47 is simply a way of saying that, that God is sovereign in salvation. Verse 47 is Jesus doing what Jesus said he would do. He said, I will build my church. Verse 47 informs us this is what he is doing. He's building his church. The Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, Paul the Apostle, in a single verse, talks about our salvation journey all the way from eternity past through life into eternity future, all in one verse, all in one sentence. He says this, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. One huge panorama of God before you were born, selecting you, predestining you, calling you in real time to make a decision to follow him, all the way into the future when you and I will be glorified. That's God's work. It says, he did this, he did that, he did this. In Acts 13, we are told, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Sort of a controversial verse because it's saying God selects certain people and brings those people in salvation to himself. Now, somebody will hear that and say, oh no, that, that's not how it worked with me. I actually made a choice to follow Jesus Christ. And of course, I would say to that, I, I know you did, but do you know that you were chosen before you made that choice? Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? 
They were following him, and he said, I did, you didn't choose me. I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. So God is sovereign in salvation. It is a divine work the Lord added to the church daily. So then, evangelism is the intersection of divine predestination and human choice. At the point where your choice intersects with divine predestination, that's when salvation happens. Which brings up a question. Should we be inviting people to have a relationship with God? Should we actually overtly be witnessing and asking people to receive Jesus Christ? I ask the question because not everybody would say yes. The strict Calvinist would say no. Um, I was giving an altar call one time and people came forward and afterwards a young man was there. He d did not like what he saw. And uh, he said, I don't like your language in, in what your, your altar call was. I said, well, explain that. He said, well, you talked about receiving Christ. And I don't like that language. He goes, I don't think that, I think that takes away from the sovereignty of God. You know, you are putting the onus on the person rather than on the sovereignty of God. And I said, young man, I think you have a problem with John chapter 1. He said, explain. John, in his gospel in chapter 1, said, And as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God to anyone who would believe in his name. So, yes, we are called to receive Christ. Many years ago, um, I was having lunch. I can say this, uh, it was such a joy, it was such an honor. I was having lunch with Dr. Billy Graham at his house. And so I thought, well, I've got him. I want to ask him a few questions about people that, that uh, I know he has met. I asked him about President Kennedy and the interactions he's had with different people. But I asked him about Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of my favorite commentators and preachers uh, in England years ago. And he goes, let me tell you something about Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, I was doing a crusade in London. And um, I had a luncheon, and I said, Dr. Jones, I'd like you and your church to be involved in my crusade here in London. And he said, Lloyd-Jones said, Dr. Graham, I would be honored to under one condition. And that is that you don't call people forward to receive Christ. And Billy Graham said, I, I can't do that. That's what I feel God's called me to do. And Lloyd-Jones said that we can't be involved in that. That's because of his position in these things. But I really like what another Calvinist who is balanced in his theology, there's not many of them, but J.I. Packer wrote a little book called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, in which he writes, it is a matter not of merely informing people, but also of inviting people. Well, that takes us to our second component of evangelism. Is, if the first is it's a divine work, then the second is it's a disciple's work. Not only a divine work, it's not only the Lord, but he, the Lord uses people to do it. It's a disciple's work. Now, let me take you back a few verses, uh, back to verse 40 of chapter 2, where we began this series. And in verse 40, it says, And with many other words... He, that is Peter, the Apostle Peter, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. How's that for an uh, invitation to receive Christ? Be saved from this perverse generation. Here's the point. Evangelism doesn't happen on its own. God uses human agents to do his work. And the active agent doing the work here happens to be a guy named Peter who is speaking to people. Go back to chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. And then look at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He is telling people, in a word, to receive Christ, to repent, to turn. Peter is doing exactly what Jesus told Peter to do. Back in Acts chapter 1, he told his disciples, Peter was part of that conversation, he said, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So yes, it is a divine work, but it is also a disciple's work. It's called the Great Commission. It's a commission given to every single follower of Christ. So, evangelism then is a cooperation between heaven and earth, between Jesus Christ and his followers. Why? Because we who have been changed by the gospel should become change agents for the gospel. It's happened to us. Our lives have changed. If they have changed, then be a change agent for the gospel. Now, this theme is repeated in several places in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, Paul writes, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Acts chapter 4, verse 33, With great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Acts chapter 5, verse 42, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching, Jesus as the Christ. Acts chapter 8. Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. This is what I want you to see. The early church was a bunch of saved souls wanting more souls saved. They were saved souls wanting more souls saved. Now, how did they do it? Well, they did it a few different ways. There's at least three different forms of evangelism that I believe the New Testament talks about. Number one, mass evangelism. That's where a speaker, like Peter, addresses a crowd, and it's done en masse. It's done in public. Mass evangelism. I am very grateful, personally, for mass evangelism because that's how I came to faith. I've told you the story tons of times about how I was watching a Billy Graham crusade. He was speaking to a huge arena, a stadium filled with people. I was watching this on television, and as I'm listening to him, I have this thought. If I was in that stadium, I would walk on the field and pray that prayer. Whew, at least I'm not in that stadium. I'm safe, and I was about to turn off the TV, and Dr. Graham looks right at the TV camera and says, if you're watching about television, you can know Christ. And thank you for laughing. You know, I've said that joke like a, or that story a thousand times. You still like it. <laughs> but that changed everything for me. Mass evangelism. Well, that also happens to be something we see in the New Testament. You know that Jesus spoke to the crowds of people in Galilee and said this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He was the first mass evangelist. Then we have Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Then we have Paul, Acts chapter 14, in Lystra, in Galatia. And in Athens, in chapter 17, speaking on the Areopagus, talking to the crowds of people. This was the method of John Wesley, George Whitfield in 18th century England. This is what Billy Graham had done, and now his son Franklin Graham. Mass evangelism. There's a second form of evangelism. Because you're thinking, well, I'm not, a, I'm not that kind of an evangelist. I'm not called to that, but let me give you the second one. Personal evangelism. A conversation, one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus spoke privately to a woman in John chapter 4 at the well in Samaria. Philip personally evangelized to the Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot in Acts chapter 8. So you might not do mass evangelism, but can you do Personal evangelism? Yes. I'm glad you said yes, because get this. You ready? 
According to Evangelism Explosion, it's estimated 95% of church members have never led another person to Christ. Only 5% were active in this study they did. 5% were active in sharing their faith and leading another person to Christ. Let's talk about a third form of evangelism. Local church evangelism. Now, I think that's really the thought of the text in Acts chapter 2. I think, I think we have a combination of the first and second form of evangelism, mass evangelism and one-on-one -on -one evangelism. This is just what naturally flowed from the life of the church. By the way, do you know why the church is in the world? You know why we're still here? I know some of you are going, man, the rapture should happen like today. You know why it hasn't yet? Because you have a task to do, and so do I. The church is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. The reason we are still here is to make as much room for people as possible. That my house may be filled. Arthur W. Pink said, if a church does not evangelize, it will fossilize. John Stott wrote this, we urgently need to return to this eager expectation. I know some churches which haven't seen a convert for 10 years or more, and if they got one, they wouldn't know what to do with him or her or it. So extraordinary would this phenomenon appear to them. I'll never forget, I Spoke at a church a couple weeks in a row several years ago. One Sunday I gave an appeal and people walked forward and received Christ. The next week I did the same. And by week two, a woman who had been going to that church for years turned to my wife and said about me, he's ruining my church. What she meant is all these new people are coming and it's been like so nice and comfortable in my little world here. And now... He's ruining my church. And I thought, if that's what it is to ruin a church, we need to ruin more churches. So it's a divine work, but it's a disciple's work. Third, it's a double work. It's a double work. Go back to verse 47. And the Lord added daily to the church, daily those who were being saved. I want you to notice those two words together. He didn't add them to the church without saving them, and he didn't save them without adding them to the church. It's a, it's a double work. We're in Acts chapter 2. A couple chapters later, Acts, the fifth chapter, it says, believers were added to the Lord. Now, we like that. We like the way that's rendered because... Yeah, it's a personal relationship. You're added to the Lord. It's about you and the Lord. That's Acts 5. But here in Acts 2, it says the Lord added them to the church. All of that to say this, salvation and church membership go together. When you get saved, God puts you in church. They go together. Why is that important? Because there's a trend these days to get away from the church, to get away from organized religion. I'm spiritual, but uh, I don't belong to any particular group. So there's a whole growing group in the American population that identify as being none, N-O-N-E, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N, that kind of nun, but an N-O-N-E, as in none of the above. Are you Catholic or Protestant? None. Are you this denomination or that? I'm none. That's very popular. I read this complaint on a website. This guy says, Hello, people of Christianity. I need a little bit of help. I am a full Christian. Now, I don't exactly know what that is. Uh, they're like, well, she's a half a Christian. That guy's like a quarter, or maybe she's three quarters. Anyway. This is what he writes. Hello, people of Christianity. I need a little bit of help. I'm a full Christian. I have been ever since I was little. I do love the Lord. I try to pray every day and read the Bible. The flip side is, I don't like church. 
I honestly believe that almost everybody there is two-faced and faking. Now, you've heard that before. You've heard people say, well, there's so many hypocrites in the church. And I, every time I hear that, I go, well, there's room for one more. Come on. <laughs> listen, listen. You have no right to give up on the church because Jesus is not giving up on the church. You have no right to give up on the church that Jesus said, I've come to build. It's the only institution he said he would build. I will build my church. You don't think the church is important, but oh, I love Jesus. I just hate church. And yet Jesus said, I've come to build my church. And then Paul the Apostle will say to Timothy, the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground or foundation of the truth. So when a person is saved, he belongs to God. When he belongs to God, God puts him in a community called the church. Now, our goal is not to fill churches. Our goal is to fill heaven. Yet in order to fill heaven, God often fills churches. Churches must make room. Now, I mentioned that only 5% of Christians are active in leading people to Christ. But get this, only 10% of churches are leading people to Christ. Only 10% of churches are leading people to Christ. 90% of churches are either not growing or are only growing because Christians leave one church to go to another church, transfer growth. If you're going to make more room, invite people into our room. So it's a divine work, it's a disciple's work, it's a double work, and fourth and finally, it is a daily work. For it says again in verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily, or one translation says day by day, another translation says every day, the Lord added to the church day by day, daily, those who were being saved. Which tells me that these first guys in Jerusalem, the early church in Jerusalem, did not see evangelism as a sporadic event. I don't see Peter saying, next week is Evangelism Sunday or Mission Week. It was just part of the continual, daily life spring of the congregation. They kept reaching out. And this is key. You know, some people might think, well, you know, when the church gets to be like 500 or 1,000 or 2,000, I think we can say that's enough. That's big enough. Anything bigger, and he's ruining my church. Well, the church in Jerusalem did not think that because they went from 120 people to 3,120 people in a day. That's ruining a church, I mean, in, in that kind of an idea. They grew from 120 people to 3,120 in a single day. And nobody looked at each other and said, I think we're done now. This is big enough. They were just getting started. In Acts chapter 4, it says 5,000 men were added to the church. I think the guy who was counting just said, I, I'm just going to guess 5,000 men. That's besides women and children. And then in Acts chapter 5, he just quits putting numbers on it and says, multitudes were added, both men and women. Why is this important? Because heaven can never be too full. There are never too many saved people. And there's Christians everywhere. Oh, would to God that that were true. You know, sometimes pastors will complain because a guy comes into a town and starts a church right down the street. Can you believe it? He started a church right down the street from our church. Good. Pray for a hundred more like him. Because the last time I checked, there's way more unsaved people out there than saved people, and we need preachers of the gospel everywhere. Heaven can never be too full. J.C. Ryle, Bishop Ryle of Liverpool, said the highest form of selfishness is being content to go to heaven alone. Well, how many unbelievers are out there? 
Somebody tried to estimate it by looking at it this way. If you took every unbeliever and lined him up, formed a line, the line would go around the earth 30 times. And the line is growing 20 miles longer every single day. Can never be too many saved people. If I were to boil it down to the irreducible minimum, I would say this. Evangelism is just holy gossip. There's a lot of unholy gossip, amen? Hey, did you hear about her? Can you believe she... How about this? Hey, have you heard about her, what the Lord has done in her life? Do you know what God has done in my life? That's holy gossip. That's what we're to be about. The Lord added daily, day by day to the church, those who were being saved. There's an old church in England I heard about. They put up a beautiful sign that says, We preach Christ crucified. Isn't that a great sign? We preach Christ crucified. Green ivy was growing on the building of the church and eventually covered up the last word of that sign. So it eventually just read, We preach Christ. Amen. That's nothing wrong with that. But the ivy kept growing. And so eventually the sign read, we preach. But the ivy kept growing. And eventually the only word that was left was, we. <laughs> we. In a lot of churches, that's the truth. It's all about we. It's just we. It's us. It's our little club. Don't ruin our church. We. We. Again, the words of Jesus, compel them to come that my house may be filled. Filled. How do we do that? Let me give you two quick suggestions, very practical. Number one, learn to see people differently. What do I mean by that? Well, you can see people as an inconvenience. Oh, there's so many people. There's crowds. You know how hard it is to get in a parking space? You can see people as an inconvenience or you can see people as an opportunity. Jesus saw crowds of people as an opportunity. In Matthew chapter 9, we are told, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So leading a person to Christ begins by loving a person for the sake of Christ. Begins with that. Learn to see people differently, number one. Number two, learn to invite people naturally. It doesn't have to be weird. Okay, I'm going to go witness now. Here it goes. I'm going <laughs> to walk up to this person and do you know? Just, just have a conversation. Let it flow. Kind of find out what that person's into and curious about. And then share what God has done. You know, my pastor, Chuck Smith, used to say, healthy sheep beget sheep. Meaning, you don't have to beat sheep and say, come on, you guys, go out there and tell people about Jesus. Just feed the sheep. They will naturally share with people. Healthy sheep reproduce. Healthy sheep will tell people where to find good food. So healthy sheep beget sheep. Never underestimate the power of a simple invitation. Yeah. Hey, I've been thinking about you. I love you. I'm concerned about you, or whatever it might be. Read this. Come with me. You know, I was talking to my dentist this week, and he said, you know how I started coming to your church and how I came to Christ? I had a neighbor who kept inviting me. He called me up and said, you ready to go to church? He goes, no. I don't want to go to church. I've been to church all my life. That's like the last thing I want to do. Kept inviting him. Finally, he called him, invited him, then drove over to his house, knocked on his door and said, you're coming, and brought him to church. Now get this. A while back on a Wednesday night, here's the power of a simple invitation. Somebody walks up to me, part of our worship team, I think, and said, uh, held their phone up and said, I'm on Snapchat. I want you to invite my friend to church. So I just looked at the phone and said, hey, I'd love you to come out to church and told him the address. He came that night. Whoa. Just somebody thought, I'm just going to make an invitation on Snapchat. 
and see what happens. And that person came, and I got to meet him after the service. So we find this even in the New Testament. Philip said to Nathaniel, we have found the one who is the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Come and see. Check it out. Giving you an invitation. According to one research group, they asked churchgoers, what is responsible for your coming to Christ and coming to church? 90 or 79%, almost 80%, said because a friend or relative invited me. 80%, a friend or relative invited me. If I were to ask you, how did you come to Christ or come to church? I bet you would say something similar. Somebody invited me. Somebody invited The power of a simple invitation. So once again, would it matter if somebody sent you the most important message of your life, but you never heard it? God has given the most important message in life. We want to be all about letting more people hear that message, making more room in our hearts, in this place, in other places, to get the message out. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for taking us the way we were, the way we are, for loving us, for giving us a fresh start, for forgiving us of our past, for making us a son or a daughter of the living God. And thank you, Lord, that you haven't given up on us. You are still working on us. You are still changing us. We love that. We love the process. It's hard sometimes. We get ourselves into trouble, but you love us nonetheless. And because of what Jesus did on a cross 2,000 years ago, and then did a few days later, rising from the dead, conquering death, we have a living Savior who offers a living hope. Lord, I pray that we will embrace the commission. And I pray, Lord, that some here would embrace the invitation. As we're closing this service, I just think it's appropriate. We've been talking about inviting people. I want to give you, if you're here, a simple invitation. If you have never prayed to receive Christ. Now, what do I mean by that? You say, I've always believed in God. Okay, good. I did too. I went to a church my whole life. I was religious. But it wasn't until I was 18, almost 19, that I gave my life to Jesus in a very personal, meaningful, authentic way. I actually asked him to come into my heart, forgive me of my past. And he did. He changed the way I think. He gave me purpose in life. He gave me a sense of meaning and hope. And he can do it for you. Others of you made some sort of religious decision at some point in your life, perhaps, or you've had spiritual inclinations, but that was then. Today, you're not walking with Christ. You're not following him. Maybe you've backslidden. You need to come home. You need to come back to him. You need to reaffirm your commitment. If either of those describes you, I want to give you an opportunity in this place at this time to say yes to the God who loves you, to say yes to the God who formed you, to say yes to the God who sent his son in your place to pay for your sin that you might enjoy heaven forever. But that will never happen unless you receive Christ. As many as received him, he gave the power to become children of God. And this could be the predestined time for you to do that. So if you're here today and you've never done that or you need to reaffirm that, you're willing to say yes to Jesus. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I'm going to leave my eyes open so that I can acknowledge you and pray for you. But if you want to do that, if you're ready to do that, if you're willing to do that, I just simply want you to raise your hand up right where you are. Just raise it up. Raising your hand up, you're just saying, right over here, Skip, pray for me. Yes, sir, God bless you. 
right up in the front to my right. And over on my right, over here. In the middle, to my left. Anyone else? Just raise your hand up. To my left, back there in the corner. Awesome. On the right side, way in the back. In the balcony, thank you. Anyone in the family room? A couple of you right over here. Awesome. If you're outside, raise your hand up. A pastor will shout out and say, we see you. Over to the right over here. Father, thank you for each one, everyone. Behind these hands are lives, joys, disappointments. But Lord, you love each one so intimately, so completely. And Father, we pray that you will do a work of salvation in their life. Their life would change from this day onward. Lord, as they make the step of faith, that they will know that there is a God in heaven who loves them, and they will find a place of satisfaction they have never known up to this point. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's all stand. We're going to close with a song. We like to close our uh, worship service with a song of praise. As we sing this song, if you raised your hand up, I want you to do something else now. I want you to find the nearest aisle. Come walk up here. And when you, you've all gathered, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, making Jesus your Lord and Savior. A prayer of invitation. Jesus called people publicly. And we're not doing this to embarrass you. We're doing this to encourage you, as you will see. So if you raise your hand, come on up. Come on up. Come on up here, man. Yeah. God bless you. So glad you came. We'll wait just another moment. Hi. Nice to meet you. How are you? Nice to meet you. Oh, I love that. Love it. Oh, I love that. Come on. I'm so glad you've come. Whether you raise your hand or not, some of you might still feel like, yeah, I'm feeling that tug in my heart. I felt that before. I don't know exactly what that is. I think that's the Holy Spirit saying this is the most important decision. You need to make it right now. If you're in the balcony and you raise your hand, come down the stairs. If you're outside, make your way in. If you're in the family room, come through the hallway. We'll help you get here. But we think it's important. We think that making a public stand for Jesus Christ is important. You know. We're living in a day and age where every group of society thinks it's important to be vocal about who they are. So do we. Uh, we are Christ followers. Uh, we do it daily. We do it publicly. Uh, it's not like a secret religion that we practice, you know, on the weekends, but all the time. Anyone else you want to come and just finally surrender to Christ? Make your way here right now, right up to the front. Those of you who have come forward, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. I'd like you to pray this prayer out loud after me. 
Come on in. Were you outside? Glad you came. Awesome. So I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. You pray this out loud after me. Say these words from the bottom of your heart. You're talking to God. Tell him this. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. That he died on a cross. That he shed his blood for me. That he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Don't go anywhere. If you've come forward, we want to give you a Bible and spend a few moments with you. So come on, let's all go over this way. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church slash give.